And so, to the attempted rescue, the crucial distinction for this part of this talk and this part of these tapes, and if I do it right, for the rest of your life, the crucial distinction, you'll find this in the work of someone named Herbert Marcuse, between what's called basic repression and surplus repression. Simple distinction. I like everything to be simple. Basic repression, the amount you need to repress the desire for pleasure and work to get the basics in life. Food, shelter, clothing, basic transportation, basic vacation, surplus repression, the amount you need to repress the desire for pleasure and work to get surplus extras beyond the basics status symbols, expensive cars, expensive clothes, expensive jewelry, the bling bling lectures coming up, luxuries, I've had friends tell me a car is no good unless it has a butt warmer. I'd never heard of a butt warmer in San Diego. I'm from New York where it's cold. You need a butt warmer. Gadgets, as Marcusa called them even back in the 60s. Of course, nowadays, computers, games, all that paraphernalia gets very expensive. A modern distinction since in the old days, before the Industrial Revolution, how long did people have to work to get the basics? All day long. They worked from the time the sun came up. They worked until the sun went down. And generally, we think they stopped working when the sun went down only because when the sun goes down, it gets dark. Generally, to work, you have to be able to see. Not me, by the way. When I work on this, I can do it with my eyes closed. But generally, to work, you have to be able to see. Sun goes down, gets dark, they couldn't see. They had to stop working, whether they wanted to or not. Maybe we don't have enough seeds in the ground. We're not sure if we'll have enough food next harvest. Maybe we'll be hungry but it's dark, I don't want to fall off a cliff. So they would stop working. Traditionally, we think they would gather around the fire for light and warmth, sing, dance, philosophize, tell jokes, express their social nature. Nowadays, it seems pretty obvious we should be able to work less than people had to work back in the old days, resting on the achievements of modern industrialization. Modern industrial society has delivered at least this part of its promise. We have developed developed such great productive technologies we see all around us today, factories, assembly lines, we have machines to do the work, we have labor-saving devices, just by the obvious meaning of the phrase, labor-saving device. We should be able to work less, have more free time to enjoy life. Sure sounds good to me. And you should have seen the expression on the face of my wife when she came here from Thailand and saw that I own a washing machine for the clothing. Wow, in America they have washing machines, they have machines to wash the clothes, they have machines to do the work. I don't have to spend my day at the river washing the clothes, banging them against a rock, waiting for them to dry in the sun. They have machines. I have more free time to enjoy my life. Seems pretty obvious that's the way it should be. On the other hand, of course, it must be painfully obvious to you all, the opposite has occurred. We in modern societies work longer, harder hours than ever before. Part of the reason for that, the invention of the accursed device in just about every ceiling. Notice I'm calling it an accursed device. I will be teaching you how to curse before we are done with this completely. But that accursed device in the ceiling, the electric light bulb, now makes it possible to work longer, harder hours, even after the sun goes down. Sun goes down, gets dark, turn on the light, continue to work right on through the night, continue to study right on through the night. I've seen from so many students' faces that's exactly what they've been doing. Try telling your boss or your teacher, oh, the sun is down, it's dark, I can't see, I'm going to go socialize, they'll think you're crazy or on drugs. Just turn on the light, continue to work right on through the night. And so the invention of the electric light bulb has made it possible for us to work longer, harder hours, even after the sun goes down. And the next main theme, it is the way modern society, modern economies use modern advertising, make people think this is the desirable lifestyle. 
work hard, make a lot of money. So far, by the way, I'm with this. I've worked hard. I've made a lot of money. But most people don't do with their money what I've done. Save it up. Oh, I mean, of course, spend your money and enjoy life. You never know when you're going to die, but I haven't died yet. And so, save up your money. Now, of course, I have my life savings. I'm free anytime I spend students tell me they think I should leave or I just want to get out of the rat race, I can retire, use my money, go travel the world, experience every beauty and pleasure this amazing planet has to offer. Not what most people do with their hard-earned money. Turn right around, give it right back to the big corporations, buy one of the expensive status symbols everyone is convinced by modern advertising is essential to being a social success, and to the extent we're all raised on this. I'll be talking about advertising to children before we're done. More ubiquitous, more ever-present than ever before, of course. With phones, of course, we spend so much time in front of advertising. We grow up with it. We believe it. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't have the status symbol, you won't have status. You don't have a status symbol car. You have a car, and it's reliable and deficient, but it gets you from point A to point, and it gets you from point A to point B reliably and efficiently, but it's a few years old, the paint is peeling, you have a few dents, you don't have any status, you don't have any designer clothes, you have clothes, and they're new clothes, and they're clean clothes, but they're from Target or from Walmart, you don't have any status, you don't have any jewelry, you don't have any jewelry, you don't have any status, and as a social creature, you won't be happy with that. And so this segment on advertising, and I am relying here on a controversial CBS News release back in the 1970s with the famous Charles Kuralt called You and the Commercial, such an effective expose of the techniques of advertisers, they screamed it was unfair, and it's very difficult for anybody to get to see it nowadays. Good luck, you. And the commercial, I have my own copy. I won't say how I got it, but the film starts by saying, you may not think you are affected by advertising, but our premise is you may be in ways that you may never have imagined. And it goes on and calls the advertising industry the leading laboratory for research in psychology in the entire world. Even back in the 1970s, they mentioned the advertisers spent a billion dollars on psychological research, marketing and motivational research. Obviously, if it was a billion back then, it's a lot more now. Think of how much money that is. What's the budget for research in psychology at your average college or university? Obviously, it's at most a few million dollars, way short of billions. I've wondered if that's more than the combined budget for research in psychology for the psych department at every college and university in the entire world. Get people <clears throat> together into what's called a focus group. You've heard of this. According to their demo, graphic, demo, of course, people, graphic, graph your pace, place in the population, according to your age, your interests, your income, pull down a screen, show you images of the various advertisements they are considering, get you to rate them, how much you like them or don't like them, rate them on a scale of 1 to 10, and this clip went past very quickly in the film, <clears throat> you in the commercial, how they used finger sensors, tap into your unconscious response, measure any increase in the moisture content on the surface of your skin, any increase in your pulse rate. That was back in the 1970s. Obviously, science has advanced a lot more since then. Nowadays, they use neurophysiology, research into your brainwave activity, see exactly which images light up which parts of your brain, it's all electrical energy, of course, in the brain, which images light up which parts of your brain, exactly how much, and design the advertisement around that successfully advertising image. And so modern advertising is not an art. You don't find advertising in the art department. Modern advertising is a science. It's 
of course, sociology, you sociology people, you want a job, help them find the right focus group, find the right demographic, psychology, frame the questions, interpret the answers, neurophysiology, measure their brainwave activity, computers and statistics, analyze all of the data. And they want your unconscious response, especially when they are showing you what the film called sexual illusions. Good-looking guys, good-looking girls, romping around together, having fun. And the aim is to get you to buy a product. And they don't want to trust you to give them your conscious response. Some people might feel guilty about admitting to having sexual feelings. Others might think they're too cool to admit that they're around by an advertisement, or probably more generally, you're in a laboratory or a focus group, there are researchers, you are not thinking under those circumstances very explicitly in sexual terms. Under those circumstances, the sexual arousal may be so small you yourself hardly notice, but they will see which images light up which parts of your brain. That's the way they'll approach it. And so I remember sexual illusions, one of my favorite commercials for close-up toothpaste. I I think that's still around today. It was on the radio. They came out and sang to the American people. How's your love life? How's your love life? What did their marketing research reveal to them? Most Americans were going to say, why not very good? Can your toothpaste help me? After all, if my love life is fine, what do I need your damn toothpaste for? Why now that you ask me, my love life is fine. Why I'm such a sexy guy. Girls come up and kiss me so often. If I use your toothpaste and that makes me any sexier, girls will come up and kiss me so much. My lips will turn into bleeding sores and I don't want that. Keep that away from me. Not what most people say. Why now that you mention it, I'm not finding enough of the right kind to people to get close up. And so they make the suggestion to you that your breath is foul, your teeth are the wrong color, try all of the different mouthwashes and teeth whiteners, see if there's any one or combination of them that can do something about the disaster that emanates from the middle of your face. If still you're not finding enough of the right kind of people to get close up, it must be your stinking armpits driving them away. Thank the Lord that you live in a society that has 36 types of deodorant. Maybe there's one or some combination of them that can neutralize the stench that comes from your armpits. If still you're not finding enough the right kind of people to get close up, it must be your smelly feet driving them away. I won't go on and chronicle the other smelly parts of your body they tried to make you feel insecure about. And this one from the Infinity Automobile, when I was visiting one of my rich cousins in her magazine, said, the Infinity. It's not a car, it's an aphrodisiac. When I first read that, I felt very puzzled. I've seen Infinities out on the freeway, and they sure looked like cars to me. And I thought a car was a, get a way to get from point A to point B reliably and efficiently. Now I see if I had an Infinity, I would have an aphrodisiac. Lots of people, of course, that's the main reason the rhino is becoming extinct. A lot of people think rhino horn is an aphrodisiac. Do some rhino horn, it'll make you horny. You don't have to go all the way to Africa and kill a rhinoceros just by it. An infinity. That's an aphrodisiac. And it seems to me, by the way, the whole perfume and cologne industry proceeds on this basic assumption. Buy this perfume, buy this cologne, it'll be an aphrodisiac, you'll drive the one you want wild. But now I'm not sure if I should get an Infinity or a Lexus. This isn't a car either. We don't sell cars. We merely facilitate love connections. And from one of my former students, I remember was in my office, and I asked him, as I often ask my students, what's your major? And he said to me, marketing. And I said to him, oh, pay attention to my marketing lectures at the end. I'm going to make you a much better marketer. And I told him, just use sex to sell everything. And he looked thoughtful for a minute and he said to me, Professor, my family owns a peach orchard in Delaware. And along with the peaches, the main thing about their orchard, by the way, is you can go out into the orchard and pick your own peaches if you know what good peaches are so you can really score. But along with their peaches, they sell a t-shirt. And on the back of the t-shirt is a young girl facing the ocean. You are looking at her from behind, and her behind is made out of peaches. And the slogan is, take your peach 
to the beach. And so I told him use sex to sell everything, and his family already knew that. They were even using sex, a woman's behind, they were even using sex to sell peaches. What the hell did that have to do with the quality of the peaches? Now, on a conscious level, of course, we look and laugh. Why, I always hope that somebody has chuckled during this. On a conscious level, we look and laugh. But the main theme on an unconscious level, they want your unconscious response. On an unconscious level, we are affected. The evidence for that is simply sales, the fact that they do it this way. The competitiveness inherent in our free enterprise system demands, if this wasn't the best way to sell something, it's an aphrodisiac, it's a love connection, take your peach to the beach when you turn your car on, does it return the favor, the Carl's Jr. girl making sex objects out of a cheeseburger, if this wasn't the best way to sell the product, some clever marketing major out there would come up with a better way. Of course, the corporations will pay you a fortune if you can come up with a better way to help them sell their products. But generally speaking, this is the way they proceed. And the reason this is so effective, the reason for everything here, and maybe in reality, the system that we have, everything revolves around competition, business and industry, jobs and promotions, sports, driving on the freeway, social and sexual sexual relations, looks, cars, clothes, everybody, everything very competitive. When you compete, you have to think of yourself primarily. Nice guys finish last. Second place is the first loser. You ain't first, you're last. Famous American philosopher Ricky Bobby. Not cheating is part of not trying? Is that Bill Belichick? I've had students say not cheating is part of not winning. That's even more telling. Unless you cheat, you have no chance to win. But I think the real slogan, not cheating, is part of not trying. And so nobody wants to finish last. Nobody wants to be a loser. So we all develop the habit of being selfish. And everybody else around us brought up this way. They've had to be selfish also. Maybe you've noticed this. Everyone is selfish. And we see that as being human nature, and maybe it is, but this maximizes it. And so everybody is selfish in a world of selfish people. You can't find real love, the true meaning of life. I try to argue love is the true meaning of life, not sex. Sorry, people. After all, there's no reason why you can't have a lot of sex. You have working genitals, you have raging hormones, no reason why you can't have lots of sex. But love is a different thing, as I try to show with what I'll call Elvis Syndrome. The celebrities, you can have all the fans, all the groupies, all the girls, all the sex, but once the celebrities realize over time, it takes time for humans to realize what's going on around them, especially when it's exciting to them. Finally, over time, the celebrities realize the fans, their groupies, it's not real love, the true meaning of life. It's all just superficial. They're attracted to me for my image, not really to me as a person. The fans, the groupies, just want to get near a celebrity so they can feel like they're glamorous celebrities also. Some of them just want bragging rights to their friends. The celebrity chose me, not you. I'm hotter than you. Once the celebrities realize that it isn't real love, it's just superficial in the end, it makes them lonely. So lonely baby, they could die. And so people in modern society have a big problem. Love is the meaning of life, but with competition, nice guys finish last, second place is a loser, nobody wants to be last, nobody wants to be a loser, everyone is selfish. Where do you find love, the meaning of life, in a world full of selfish people? Obviously difficult or impossible. And so people get desperate, need to find love, the meaning of life, can't find it in a world full of selfish people. That that's how the advertisers get into your subconscious. When you're desperate, reason breaks down, emotion takes over. You would like to wish, you would like to hope, you would like to believe. <clears throat> Same with the doctrine of the afterlife I'll cover later. But for now, when are people most likely to start believing in some religious doctrine about an afterlife? When they're old, when they're desperate, confronting death, confronting extinction. When you're young, like now, hopefully you're calm, you can examine the evidence and you realize no evidence for an afterlife. If I really thought there was an afterlife, if I really thought 
but my father was waiting for me. I haven't seen him in so long, and I miss him. I have a heavenly father who's waiting for me, who's really fantastic, and I've never met. If I really thought that was waiting for me, I would want to die and get there as soon as I could. But I don't really believe at all. I really believe all the evidence suggests to me when I die, that's it. They put me into the dirt, and it's over. You're gone. You rot, you turn into dust, and everybody shortly forgets about you. And so I don't want to die. I don't want to be put into the dirt and have everybody forget about me. I want to have fun. I would like to live as long as I can, have as much fun as I can, not to get old and decrepit, that's no fun, but to young forever, forever young. I want to live forever. I want to have fun forever. That's the way I feel when I'm calm and I use reason and I examine the evidence. Then you start to get old, you get desperate, you realize you're going to die, you're going to be put in the dirt. That's it. You're so desperate at that thought, you would like to wish, you would like to hope, you would like to believe there is an afterlife. I'm going to see all my loved ones again. It will be for eternity. I'll have eternal life. Same thing here. People are desperate. Reason breaks down on a conscious level. They look and laugh. Emotion takes over. They would like to wish. They would like to hope. They would like to believe. All their problems finding real love and affection can be solved if only I buy the right product. If only I get myself a fancy red sports car. If only I buy myself a custom tailored suit. If only I get myself some diamond rings, some diamond earrings, some diamond nose rings, diamond navel rings, diamond toe rings. Then. I'll I'll be popular and life will be fulfilling because people don't know what else to do. They're not trained in techniques of social analysis like I'm teaching you now. They don't realize the problem is a super competitive world where nice guys finish last and second place is a loser. So they try to make you think the problem is you. There's something wrong with you. You're ugly. You smell bad. Your hair is a disaster. You're having a bad hair day. Your nose. Get that thing smashed and get something decent placed in the middle of your face. One of my students came up to me and told me she had a cousin that had had seven nose jobs. Took me a minute to remember people only have one nose. And you're too fat. You jiggle after you go by and everybody laughs at you. And you ladies, I didn't realize this, but now I have outed you. You ladies are very hairy. I saw an advertisement on one of the bulletin boards. Ladies, get rid of that unwanted facial and body hair at Beauty by Jody. Improve your dating ratio. What the hell is improve your dating ratio? What's the ratio? A ratio of guys who won't think you're so hairy like a gorilla that maybe it would be okay to date you? Didn't some model just get death threats because she showed her hairy legs? Of course, lip wax. We don't want a woman who has a mustache. Underarm wax. <clears throat> that sounds painful to me, getting the hair ripped out of your underarms. Bikini wax. I saw something on that on TV that looked pretty sketchy. Brazilian wax. I own, won't even go back that far. They make you think the problem is you. There's something wrong with you. And one young lady came up to me after lecture. What she said struck me like thunder in my ear. Let me know if you think this is right, professor. She said to me, every single one of your female students especially has at least thought about having a cosmetic surgery. No, she didn't say that the men don't. Every single one. Is this true, ladies? I've had a couple of them come up to me and say, oh, not me. Well, bless them and good luck to them. Every single one of your female students especially has at least thought about having a cosmetic surgery. They make you think the problem is you. There's something wrong with you. Generating the negative esteem, negative body image so ever-present in our society. The liberating part of this, the freedom part of this, it's not that there's something wrong with you. It's not that you're so ugly, you smell so bad, your body is such a ridiculous shape. The problem is a super competitive world where nice guys finish last, second place is a loser, makes everybody selfish. But most people don't realize that. They think the problem is them. And even now that I've taught you that the problem isn't you, it's society, what are you going to do about it? You still need love too. Good luck finding it in a world full of selfish people. You'll get desperate, reason will break down, emotion takes over. And if this is effective with us adults, imagine how much more effective it is when advertising is directed at children, young children, and how much advertising do young children see nowadays. Of course, it's all over the place. It's absolutely unavoidable almost every minute of the day. And young children are particularly vulnerable. Young children cannot distinguish family 
fantasy and reality at all, at least adults with somewhat well-developed rational and critical capacities on a conscious level realize it's all nonsense, though on an unconscious level we're affected too, but children believe everything they've heard. Children really believe in Santa Claus, even though I was raised Jewish. I believed in Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy. I didn't burst your bubble. Children believe everything. And what we learn in childhood often stays with us for life. What religion are people as adults? <clears throat> if they still have one, generally it's the religion they absorbed in their childhood stays with them for life. In my case, by the way, it wasn't so much my religion, it was the fact that I'm the fan of the New York Yankees baseball team. Generally speaking, I hate the Yankees. They stand for everything I despise, the rule of the rich. Dodgers also, by the way, they have a payroll of 250 million. Padres have a payroll of 50 million. How is this fair? But my father worked in the Bronx right across the street from the Yankee Stadium, and so they're my childhood homeboy there who I grew up with. I can't root against against them no matter how hard I try. <clears throat> the moral of the story is what we learn in childhood often stays with us for life whether we like it or not. And so when you sit a child down in front of a television set or any advertising medium that is not an innocent and innocuous babysitter, <clears throat> it is the largest laboratory for research in psychology in the entire world, has only one aim. Turn that child into what the film you in the commercial called a consumer consumer trainee. From George Will, Republican columnist, one of his columns, A Consumer Cadets. Marketers are excited that children as young as 12 months old are capable of brand associations, I'll show you George Will wrote. The marketers are excited they can start brainwashing kids at one year old. Consumer trainee. Teach the kid the meaning of life, the key to happiness, owning the right toys. He who dies with the most toys wins. One of my former students, housewife, housewife from Rancho Santa Fe, very wealthy community, heard me giving this lecture in the ad afternoon, Impact of Advertising on Children, Consumer Trainees. She went to hear her young daughter perform in the Rancho Santa Fe Elementary School play that very same night. The children sang a song on advertising called It Takes a Good Label, sung to the tune of It Takes a Good Woman from Hello Dolly in the key of F. I would sing, but I can't. Can't. Instead of price tags, we look at the name. It's advertising. We have to blame. We can spot that Louis Vuitton miles away. It's only peer pressure that makes us this way. Yes, it takes a good label to make us kiddies able to keep up with friends at the school. Be it Vanderbilt or Bonjour, so soon Loren be so sure. Next week, Calcoin is not the rule. Here's me give a lecture on the impact of advertising on children. Consumer trainees, consumer cadets own the right toys. Rancho Santa Fe Elementary School. It's sort of price tags. We look at the name. It's advertising. We have to blame. It's only peer pressure that makes us this way. It takes a good label to make us kiddies able to keep up with friends at the school who wrote that. Not the kids. Must have been one of the teachers. What message was that teacher trying to give the parents about the values of the children? And as I recite this, I wonder if that teacher managed to keep their job. And so, of course, this creates a society where people are convinced they have to work their lives away, buy expensive status symbols, couple of problems here. Anyone who is attracted to you on the basis of your status symbol isn't really attracted to you. They're attracted to your status symbol. They're attracted to your car. They're attracted to your fake boobs. They're not really attracted to you. And once you realize this, and after hearing me say it, I don't see how you could fail. You won't be happy either. Everyone wants to be loved for themselves. Is that true? I wonder. Sometimes everyone wants to be loved for themselves. And the second problem, of course, the more time you spend at work making the money to buy the status symbols, the less time you have to meet people. Meet somebody who's really a good match for you, not as is so often the case, I think, just the fulfillment of the images the advertisers plant in all of our subconscious minds from early childhood. This is what an attractive and desirable person should look like. This is what an attractive and desirable person should own. Somebody who's really a good match for you. But even if you manage to find such a person, you hardly have time to fully develop and enjoy the relationship with them. You're so busy, they're so busy, everybody's 
so busy, parents hardly even have time for their children, and so I can draw the stereotypical portrait of your stressed out American business person. Traditionally, the father with women's lib could be the mother, long, hard hours under stress, first thing they grab after work, a beer, a shot, intoxicant of choice, try to forget the stress of work, and after all, you can't take your stress at work out on the boss or your co-workers, you'll wind up getting fired. So who do you take your stress out on? Who gets hurt when a bomb goes off? People standing around the bomb. Who gets, ho who gets hurt when the stressed out business person goes off? People standing around the stressed out business person. If they go home, that will be the family, especially if they've already started drinking. Instant asshole, just add alcohol. All that repressed aggressiveness, frustration comes pouring out. Go to the bar, fights at the bar, go to the basketball game, fights at the basketball game, go home, fight with the family, generating the domestic problems ever present in our society, leaving so many children emotionally scarred. I once had a student put up her hand and say, Professor, is this why the divorce rate in our country is so high? Sounded right to me. Marry each other on the basis of image and status. Then, of course, these stressed out superficial people have to live with each other. Good luck with that. I had no question about my getting enough exercise, although exercise is the best way to deal with stress. Exercise may be the only good way to deal with stress, but who has the time to exercise? I'm too busy, and even if I have time to exercise, I'm too tired. And it isn't like I'm tired from doing physical labor. If I did physical labor, that would be my exercise. All I do is look at computer screens all day and push around papers all day, tired from all of the stress. So the only thing I have time to do when I get home, energy to do when I get home, plop myself down on the couch. You've heard the phrase couch potato, stuff my face full of food. One of the pleasures that is so readily available in our fast food culture. Read the book, see the movie, Fast Food Nation. They they do their focus groups, they do their marketing research, they know exactly what chemicals to put in the food to make it taste delicious to you, and it does taste delicious. Give me a bag of potato chips, I can't just eat one, I eat the whole thing. It tastes delicious, but almost none of it is good for you, full of saturated fats, cholesterol, caffeine, sugar, and so the moral of the story is supposed to be. We've created a society where the ethic is you snooze, you lose. We've created a world where everybody is very wealthy, but nobody has time to sleep, everybody extremely exhausted. And so in the end, what you should do is try to get yourself a job that pays you adequately. I'm not advocating being poor. It's no fun to be poor, but make sure your job gives you enough time off to enjoy your life. What's the point of having money if you don't have time to enjoy the money? My brother once said to me, nobody ever laid on their deathbed, nobody ever laid dying and said, gosh, I wish I'd spent more time working at the office with the boss, wish I'd spent more time doing the things I love with the people I love. What's the best thing about teaching, by the way? What's the three best things about teaching? June, July, and August. I have had a hundred consecutive days off over the summer every year of my life. People say, oh, did you have a good Thanksgiving vacation? Four days is a vacation. I get a hundred days off every year. It takes me several weeks to even de-stress enough that I can start to enjoy my time off and get yourself a job that you like. If you can get yourself a job that you like, they say, you'll never work a day in your life. One of my former students, young United States Marine, came up to me after this and said to me, my father taught me if when you get home from work, you say, damn, I can't believe they paid me to do that, then you got the right job. Whenever I got home from work, I thought to myself, damn, I can't believe how much they paid me to do that. Get a job that you like, you'll never work a day in your life.